Hi, and welcome to lecture four. In this video, we are going to talk about Bayesian correlation, basically how to perform a Bayesian analysis for any sort of correlational design. So to do that, we're going to recall the definition of the Pearson correlation coefficient, and then we're going to talk about how to perform model comparison and estimation in a Bayesian manner on that correlation coefficient from some sample data. Along the way, we're going to take a moment to review the basics of Bayesian inference as we have developed during the first three videos for this course. So let's get started by recalling the definition of the Pearson correlation coefficient. You probably have dealt with correlations before, but it would be helpful if we know exactly what a correlation is. So to do that, let's consider uh, when a correlation would be something that we would do. So let's suppose that we had two sets of scores. Uh, these might be scores on some tests or some personality measures or uh, any kind of, any kind of uh, continuous variable that you can imagine. And you ask yourself, to what degree are these two sets of scores associated? Technically, we ask, how do they co-vary? And so what this requires is for us to develop the notion of a covariance. And so let's do that real quickly. A covariance uh, can be given to you in this formula. I'll briefly explain what the formula is and then actually show you how to do a very simple example by hand, just so that you can see where the correlation coefficient comes from. So in a nutshell, the covariance is simply the average cross product between deviations in one variable and deviations in the other variable. And by deviations, we mean the difference between each score and that set of scores mean. So let's, let's make this hands-on by looking at a very simple example first. So let's consider uh, two sets of scores, X and Y. Each of them have five measurements. So the X scores are six, two, five, three, and four, as you see in that vertical column. The Y scores are six, two, six, four, and two. And we want to measure the degree to which these are associated using this notion of covariance, okay? So what we do first is we find the mean and standard deviation of those two sets. So I'm gonna assume that you know how to do that. And when we do this, we get a mean of four for both sets and standard deviations of 1.41 and 1.79. Technical note, I'm using the population level standard deviation. That is, I'm dividing by five when I find the variance here. I'm not dividing by five minus one. Um, so that's technical note, it works out either way as long as I'm consistent with my covariance as well. So let's go on. Uh, what we need to do to get covariance is we need to find the deviation scores. Uh, so we need to subtract each of the X scores from its mean and each of the Y scores from its mean. And then we'll find their product and then add those products and divide by N, which is five. So let's do that. Let's find the, uh, let's find the X and Y deviations. So what are these? Well, I take six minus four, right? Four is the mean for the set of X scores. Uh, six minus four is two. 2 minus 4 is negative 2, and so on. Same thing with the y's. I take 6 minus the y mean, which is 4, which gives me a deviation score of 2. 2 minus 2, 6 minus, uh, sorry, 2 minus 4 equals minus 2. 6 minus 4 equals 2, etc. Okay, so these are the deviation scores. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that the deviations tend to co-vary in the sense that these are both positive, these are both negative, these are both positive, uh, that kind of differs here and here. So you might get some intuition here that if they're positive together and negative together, they're going to covary very well. And that's kind of the idea of what covariance captures. So to do that, what covariance does is it multiplies these two things right here. And if they're the same sign, that is if the, the scores are covarying together, you're going to get positive products. And the more positive products you add, the bigger the covariance. That's the intuition here. So let's see what that covariance or the, those cross products multiply to. So two times two is four. Negative two times negative two is four. One times two is two. And then these two both vanish to zero. So the covariance is found by taking the sum of these products. So four plus four plus two is 10. And then what do we do? Well, we divide by n. So there are five pairs of scores here. So our covariance is a fifth of 10, which is two, okay? So the covariance is two, so what? It would be nice if we could standardize this measure somehow, and that's exactly what the Pearson correlation does. The Pearson correlation says take that covariance, 
and then divide by the standard deviation of x and also divide by the standard deviation of y. And when you do that, you then get a special kind of number. Okay, so for this example, the correlation is two divided by those two standard deviations, which is 0.79. And one of the things that always happens with the Pearson correlation is that it is bounded between negative one and positive one. Um, scores of positive and negative one mean a perfect association as you get closer to those endpoints of plus and minus one, the degree of association is increasing. So that's what correlation is. Now before we move on, you may already have noticed that there's something kind of weird going on. You may be used to seeing the correlation written this way as an R. And what you see on the screen in front of you, and I haven't said this yet, but what you see on the screen may look like a P to you. And if you think that's the case, you're not alone. This looks kind of like a P because I have a really hard time writing the Greek letter Rho. This is not a P, okay? But instead, it is the Greek letter for R, and the Greek letter is Rho, R-H-O. So throughout the lecture, I'm going to be referring to this Rho as, uh, and, and I'll try to always denote it this kind of curly P, right? When I draw a P, it looks like that, okay? This doesn't look like that. This looks something like, like that. It's a little bit different. Uh, I'll try to be very, very clear as I'm talking through the lecture. So why do we use the Greek letter instead of the regular letter R? The answer is because we're going to be doing inference on the population level correlation, right? In statistical inference, we always want to know what's going on at the population level. And more, more often than not, the population level parameters are written as Greek letters. So for correlations, it is written as a rho, R-H-O. Okay, so let's do an example. This is going to be an example that will carry us not only at, through a review of Bayesian inference, but also in terms of how to do a Bayesian correlation in JASP, which we'll open up in a second. So just for an example, let's suppose that as researchers, we are interested in the relationship between math anxiety and performance on some standardized assessment. So this is a typical kind of research question. You've probably uh, seen papers like this before. You're curious to see how these two concepts correlate, how they co-vary with each other. So as we know, the story of statistical inference goes as follows. The first thing that we do is we define some hypotheses or models about the population parameter of interest. In this case, it is the correlation rho. Okay? And those two models are as follows. There's a null hypothesis that says that rho equals zero. That is, there is no correlation. There is no relationship between math anxiety and performance. The alternative hypothesis would be sort of the opposite, would be that there is some non-zero correlation rho between math anxiety and performance. So very simply, the null hypothesis is that rho equals zero, and the alternative hypothesis is that rho is non-zero. Okay? Now what do we do once we've done that? Well, we collect some data, and here's the data that we're going to say we've already collected. We've got 65 observations and we found a correlation. Notice I use R because this is a sample correlation. We, we got a correlation of 0.37. So we now want to do some inference on this. Is this. Does this support the null or does this support the alternative? Now there's two paths for this as we have discussed throughout this course. And we're gonna take these in parallel. On the left side of the screen, this is the classical path, the uh, frequentist path, if you will. What the frequentist does is that they compute the probability of observing that data if the null is true. Right, so if there is no correlation, what's the likelihood that we would have seen a correlation of 0.37? That probability is called a p-value, and our interpretation is if the p-value is small, then that data is rare under the null, which leads us to reject the null as a reasonable model of our data. And thus, uh, since we reject the null, that gives us sort of an indirect amount of support for the alternative. The Bayesian approach says instead of doing a p-value, we compute a Bayes factor which is the relative likelihood of observing that data under both models. Okay, it's written as a fraction, and the interpretation is if this Bayes factor is bigger than one, that means the data is more likely under this model, the null hypothesis. And if it's less than one, that means that the data is more likely under the, null, the alternative hypothesis. So either way, we get a direct degree of support for one model or the other. 
Just to recall the difference between p-values and Bayes factors, because these are, in a sense, the critical differences between the frequentist and Bayesian path, the p-value, again, is the probability of the data under the null. It only considers the fit of the null as a potential model for the data. It completely ignores the fit of the alternative. So when we say that we have support for the alternative in this frequentist setting, it's only ever indirect support. It's not direct, right? It's, it's support because we threw out the other one, but we didn't actually test it. So it's kind of, to me, kind of lacking. The base factor, on the other hand, it considers the relative adequacy of both models as predictors of the data, right? By this fraction here, this fraction is simultaneously considering the fit of the data, uh, the, pro the likelihood of the data under the null and the alternative, and thus it can directly index your support for either H0 or H1, something that the p-value cannot do. We interpret it as follows. If Let's say just for, for example, we had a BF01 of 8, then that would mean that the observed data are eight times more likely under H0 than under H1. That's a very easy statement to uh, play Mad Libs with, right? Just put in your Bayes factor right here, and you too can make a coherent statement about the likelihood of your data under the two models. Now, one of the things that we haven't done in this course yet is kind of give some thresholds, if you will, for you know, what's a, what's a big enough Bayes factor? What's, what's good, what's not good? And so the most common uh, guidelines for interpreting the level of evidence that comes from a Bayes factor are, are roughly due to Jeffries in 1961. And the range goes as follows. If you have a Bayes factor between 1 and 3, this is typically considered small anecdotal evidence. Between 3 and 10 might be considered moderate. And as you can see, as we go up in the ranges, we go to strong, very strong, extreme. Uh, in some sense, these verbal labels are a little bit silly. Um, I do want to stress that these are only guidelines, and if you have a base factor of 2.9, don't stress over whether that's anecdotal or moderate. You know, don't round up just to get it in the moderate range. Report it for what it is and interpret it as such. Okay. So how does Bayes work? Again, this is all just review. Remember, Bayes works based on Bayes' theorem, which says that the posterior belief in your model, that is the belief in your hypothesis before, or sorry, after seeing data, is equal to the prior belief in the hypothesis times some updating factor. And if you have two models to consider at the same time, then you just take their fraction and you get a very nice statement. You get that the posterior odds is equal to the prior odds times the base factor. There's that base factor showing up again. Now, what does this do? Well, uh, this, this gives us lots of different flexible ways to think about what a base factor is. It lets us use the base factor to, to, uh, to compute posterior probability, as we saw in the last lecture. So let's, um, let's go on in a little bit more closely related to the correlation example, and uh, as we move on, we're going to really pin down what we mean by a Bayesian analysis of correlation. To do that, we need to talk about priors, okay? So again, uh, this notion of prior in Bayesian inference is, you know, it shows up all the time. What exactly do we mean by prior? So I'll remind you, really, that there are two different types of priors that one must consider when doing Bayesian analysis. So first, there's the priors on the models or hypotheses themselves. And second is the priors on the parameters within a given model. So let me explain what I mean by this. First, let's consider priors on models. So we ask ourselves, before observing data, what's the relative likelihood of these two competing models? So we did this on a homework exercise. We, we looked at this again in lecture three. The common default that is most often used is that we set the prior probabilities equal to each other. That is, we set them equal to a half, okay? Probability of H0 is a half, and probability of H1 is a half. We call this one-to-one -one prior odds. Again, if you don't have any prior notion about your null hypothesis versus your, versus your alternative hypothesis, this is a good way to start, right? Just assume that they are one-to-one -one odds. Now note, these prior model probabilities must always add to one. So if, if you set it, um, you know, if you set three to one odds, you would need to set the probabilities in such a way that they added to one. So something like 0.75 plus 
and then by Bayes' theorem, these prior model probabilities are updated after observing data. Now we've looked at this before, remember posterior odds is equal to prior odds times the Bayes factor, but what I want to give you is an example of how we actually use this in practice and give you kind of a conceptual diagram for this. So again, from lecture three, we, we found out that the posterior probability of, say, the null hypothesis is going to equal the posterior odds for that null hypothesis divided by one plus the posterior odds. So let's see how this works. Let's consider an example where we start with prior odds of one to one. So I'm going to use one of these pizza plots like JASP uses. So here visually, this would be something that's like half in favor of the null and half in favor of the alternative. Now, what do you do? You observe data and that data is going to update your prior odds. The data that we observed, again, this is just for instance, gave us a Bayes factor in favor of the null, so BF01 of nine. So what happens? Well, remember the fundamental equation here is that the posterior odds are equal to the prior odds times the Bayes factor. The prior odds was one, right, one to one, times the Bayes factor is nine. So that means that the posterior odds are now nine to one. And so this is gonna result in something that looks like this, where your the area in this pizza plot associated with the null hypothesis is now nine times larger than the area associated with the alternative hypothesis. So what you can see visually here is that after observing these data, I have much more belief in this reddish part, this belief in the null hypothesis than I do in this little white part. Now, how did I get nine tenths? Well, this comes directly from this equation. So the posterior odds are nine to one or just mathematically nine. So what does that look like? That looks like nine divided by nine plus one, nine over 10 is 0 0.90. So nine tenths or 0 0.90. So that's how Bayesian updating works to update prior model odds to give you posterior model odds. So that's one use of the word prior. The second use of the word prior, and it's very, very, uh, now we're gonna talk specifically about correlation, is the notion of priors on parameters within the given model. Okay, so this is very important now to consider when we go into JASP in a second because we're gonna need to set a prior for our alternative hypothesis. So let's talk about what we mean by this. Well, remember our model definitions were as follows. The null hypothesis was set to be rho equals zero, that is zero correlation. The alternative hypothesis was set to be rho is not equal to zero. Now that's all well and good, but you have to ask, what exactly do we mean by rho is not equal to zero, right? There's uncertainty about what that value of rho would be. And so this is where the notion of prior uncertainty about rho comes in. We quantify this uncertainty by placing a distribution on rho. So we're gonna put some probability distribution. That's what we call our prior on the parameter. So let's just suppose that we have absolutely no idea what to expect in this experiment. So in this case, we might believe that any value of rho is equally likely to occur before we see the data. So in this case, we would say that rho is uniformly distributed on the interval negative one to one. Okay, this is a uniform prior. And it might look something like this. We've seen this before. We saw this with our binomial example in the last few lectures. A uniform prior is just a flat prior. Again, this says that before seeing any data, a correlation down here at say negative, close to negative one is just as likely as a correlation at positive one, right? They all have the same likelihood, the same height, okay? Now I will note, this is the default that is used in JASP. So if you have already played, played ahead and gone into JASP and done some kind of correlation or whatever, this is probably what you used and possibly didn't even know it. There are other priors that we can use. So there are other priors that JASP uses, and these um, all fit into a special family. So the uniform prior that we use is just one of an infinite class of useful priors that's called a stretched beta prior. Now, you don't really need to know all of the mathematics of what we mean by a stretched beta prior, but I'll, I'll say this just for intuition's sake. We used a beta prior in the last few lectures because remember those priors that we sketched for the population parameter on that probability of success on each trial you know the binomial example those were called beta priors they were beta distributions 
but they go from zero to one. For a correlation, we need the parameter to extend more than that. We need it to stretch out, not from zero to one, but from negative one to one. So that's why this is called a stretched beta prior. And so what I wanna illustrate here for you are three specific stretched beta priors that we could often use in our Bayesian analyses of a correlation. So you see the one that we've already dealt with. That's this dashed line here, okay? That is a stretched beta prior of width 0.5. It's also a uniform distribution. In other words, the uniform prior, the uniform distribution is an example of a stretched beta prior. Now, if you say, I want a stretched beta prior of width uh, one half, so this one right here, this is the dotted line, okay? And you'll notice that this one's kind of interesting. This one peaks at zero and is smaller on the end. So if your prior belief is something like, you know, I really think there's not much correlation here and certainly not gonna be a really high correlation, then this, this dotted line might be a really good one to use. We might use a stretched beta prior of width 0.5. On the other hand, suppose you believe strongly before seeing the data that the correlation is going to be really strong, that is either positive one or negative one, then this solid line might better reflect your prior belief. In other words, you believe that strong correlations down here at this end and this end are much more likely than correlations here in the middle. <clears throat> so this is a stretch beta prior of width two. So you can encapsulate a lot of different types of belief, prior belief about your correlation using this family of priors. So again, they're called stretched beta priors and they are controlled by this width parameter. So all these things that I just said are um, written right here for you. So you can, you can take a look at the notes. The, again, the width one stretch beta prior, this is the JASP default. This is your uniform prior, okay? So if we do nothing to change, that's what JASP is gonna give us, as we'll see in a second. If we change the width to 0.5, that's gonna give us more prior mass at zero. That's this dotted line here, okay? And again, that's useful if you believe the correlation is going to be small. And then if you say width two, that's gonna give you more prior mass at the ends at plus or minus one. And you might ask, when's this useful? Well, if you're doing test retest reliability, right? You would hope before seeing any data that you have a high test retest reliability. And so having more prior mass there might make more sense. So in that case, doing a stretch beta prior of width two is a good example. So that's the priors that JASP is going to use for your Bayesian correlation. So really there's not much left to do. At this point, it's time to open up JASP and do this thing. So let's just remember what our data was. Our data was 65 participants and we observed a correlation of 0.37. So at this point, let's open up JASP. All right, so there's JASP, I'm gonna drink. Now, JASP again, uh, there's two ways to use JASP. One way is to load a data set in. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. But another way to do it is if you have the summary statistics already, you can do the Bayesian analysis on the summary statistics very simply. The way we do it is we click on this plus, which shows you the extra modules you can add on. And we're going to go down and select summary statistics. And when we do that, that's going to give you a new module up here that you can actually click. When I click on summary statistics, I'm going to go down here to the regression section and I'm going to select Bayesian correlation. And this is going to give us some things that we can enter. So the sample size was 65 and the Pearson's R that we observed was 0.37. And when I hit tab to get it away, you can already see that we've got some minimal output. In fact, let's hide all that. There's our summary. There's our Bayes factor. You can see that we have a Bayes factor in favor of the alternative. So it's BF10 is around 13.9394. And it even gives us the p-value associated with this as well. So this is enough to go start doing some write-up, but there's more that we should and well, that we can and should do. Let me just show you a couple of other things that we will want to check. The, remember the last lecture, we talked about how to actually compute the Bayes factor directly from the posterior distribution. That was called that Savage Dickey method. If you click on prior and posterior under plots, that's going to give you the output that we uh, were describing in that last lecture. Here is one of those prior posterior plots. 
So again, just to recall, the dashed line here is the prior. Notice it's flat. Okay, that's that uniform prior that we were just talking about. We're actually gonna change that in a second to see how things change. And then the, the solid line is the posterior distribution. So this is the, the probability, th this is the uh, belief in the value of the correlation um, after seeing the data. And you can see it's peaked around here. It's peaked pretty close to the observed correlations. Peaked at 0.356, we observed 0.37. So that's not, uh, that's not surprising. It also gives us the 95% credible interval on that, um, on that correlation. Gives us this pizza plot, gives us the Bayes factors. Uh, where does the Bayes factor come from? Remember, if you consider the belief at zero, so uh, if you look at the belief that the correlation is equal to zero, right, that's the null hypothesis. Notice before seeing the data, it's up here. After seeing the data, it's down here. So your belief in the null has actually decreased. How much? It's decreased by a factor of 13.93, that Bayes factor. So that's where this is all coming from. So what I want to do now is talk about how do you take this output that you see in JASP and all of the rich data that we're given and turn it into a write-up, okay? So let's switch back over to our notes and let's walk through a typical write-up, a complete write-up of this Bayesian analysis. Okay. So the first thing that you would obviously want to do is report the results of your hypothesis test. So there's a couple things to do here. First is we should define the hypotheses that are, under, that are being compared and also specify the prior that we used under the alternative hypothesis. So the way we might say that is this. Under the null hypothesis, we expect a correlation of zero between math anxiety and performance. Thus, we define H0 to be rho equals zero. So far, so good. Now, what about the alternative? The alternative hypothesis is two-sided, that is H1 is rho not equal to zero. And here's where we specify the prior. We assigned a uniform prior probability to all values of rho between negative one and positive one. Now, if you did a different prior, you would say we assigned a stretched beta prior of width 0.5 or two, whichever one you use, to the values of rho between negative one and positive one, okay? So that sets up the hypothesis test. Now we want to actually report and interpret the Bayes factor. So in this case, we found a Bayes factor of BF10 equals 13.93. We got that directly from JASP. And we should interpret this. This means that the observed data are approximately 14 times more likely under H1 than H0. In fact, we can go one step further. We can use that chart of evidence levels from Jeffries and say this indicates strong evidence in favor of H1. It's a nice little compact way to write that. The next thing that we should do, now JASP doesn't give us this, but we can easily calculate, and that's to calculate and report the posterior model probability for our preferred model. So we preferred H1, right? Calculating the posterior probability is easy. We just take the posterior odds, divide by one plus the posterior odds. Since we had one-to-one -one model probability before seeing the data, the posterior odds is equal to one times the base factor, which is 13.93. So taking that Bayes factor divided by one plus the Bayes factor gives us a posterior probability of 0.93, which we can write up as follows. Assuming prior odds of one to one for H1 and H0, our observed data updated these odds to 13.93 to one in favor of H1. This is equivalent to a posterior model probability of this. Probability of H1 given the data is 0.93. Again, use this, use this as your uh, you know, there's, there's a game that we play called Mad Libs where you have the structure of the story, but you just fill in the words. They're literally, it's, that's what you're doing here, just filling in the blanks with your information from your output. Now, the second thing we should do, that's the hypothesis test. The second thing we should do is report the results of our parameter estimation. Let me go back to JAST and just remind you what we're looking at. Here, we're looking at this 95% credible interval, the median, that kind of thing. So the stuff about the posterior distribution itself. Now I will mention in green, you'll notice I've written, this, is, this only makes sense if H1 is the preferred model. So why? Well, if H0 is the preferred model, you know what the parameter is. The parameter is equal to zero, right? Because the model is H0 is rho equals zero. So there's no sense in doing parameter estimation if the best model is one that sets rho equal to zero. So this only makes sense and only should be done if H1 is the preferred model. 
Now, it was in this case, so let's move on. Here, we're going to specify the parameter of interest and then remind the reader of the prior. So some of this is repeating, right? Of interest is the posterior distribution for um, rho, which is the population level correlation between math anxiety and performance. Under H1, rho was assigned a uniform prior over the interval from negative 1 to plus 1. There's nothing new there. Again, just in terms of narrative, it's nice to remind the reader what the prior was. Then we can report that 95% credible interval from JASP. And so we would say the posterior distribution for rho has a median of 0.356 with a central 95% credible interval that ranges from 0.134 to 0.554. Remember, those numbers came directly from here. Okay. So this plot right here is everything that we used in that write-up. So I would also encourage you to, you know, if you're writing this up in a paper yourself, to save that image and then pop it into your manuscript. Okay. So that is really the main goal of today. Now, before I close this lecture, I do want to show you how to play around a little bit more in JASP. But let's just review real quickly. So um, Bayesian correlation, reasonably simple to do. The main thing that we need to make sure that we know what we're doing with is how to specify the prior. Oh, one of the things I said I was going to do was uh, change that prior a little bit. So let's go back to that prior distribution, that stretched beta prior, and let's look at each one of these. So the solid one is your width 2 prior, uh, sorry, your width 2 stretched beta distribution, and then this dotted line is your width 1 half stretched beta distribution. So how do you change that in JASP? Well, down here, you'll see it says prior, stretched beta prior width. 1 is the uniform distribution. If I change that to 2, and I just hit tab to make it, it's going to recompute everything for us. So you'll see the prior. Notice the dash line now looks like that one that's got a higher, um, higher mass at the ends. You'll notice because it's a little lower to the ground, so to speak, here, it doesn't decrease the, uh, the belief that it's zero quite as much, so the base factor is a little bit smaller, but it's still reasonably large. It's still good support for the alternative. If you, on the other hand, uh, thought, uh, you know, the, the, more, the more likely value for the correlation is probably zero, you could use that one-half stretched prior. So I'll change that to 0.5. Give it just a second to recompute the graph. In this case, the base factor is going to be a little bit bigger because the belief that rho is zero is decreasing by a larger amount, okay, by a larger factor. Okay. And in fact, one thing that I will show you just for kicks is if you click this Bayes factor robustness check, it will actually compute the Bayes factor for the entire range of widths for that stretched beta prior from zero all the way up to two, which is the max value. And you can see across this whole range of widths, the evidence lies mostly in the strong category. So in other words, don't stress too much about the width of the beta prior. Uh, a width of one is just as good as any of these. They're all qualitatively the same level of evidence. So this is a nice thing to put in as well. Okay, so now let's do one last thing in our lecture and let's look at how to use actual raw data in JASP to do uh, correlation. So to do that, I mean, if I had a data set around, I could just load it in there, but I'm going to use one from the JASP data library. Okay, so I'm going to go here and open up the main menu, and I'm going to go to Open, and down here is going to be a data library. This is already imported into JASP when you download the software package. I'm going to go to this uh, Chapter 4 under Regression, and it's going to give me several data sets. You can play with any of these. You'll notice each one of them has two different things. One has a J on it and the other doesn't. The one with the J actually has a JASP analysis annotated in there, so you can kind of follow along. Or you can open the raw data file. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the Big Five Personality Traits file, and I'm going to open up the raw one, so the one without the J. Okay. So it's going to take just a second. It's going to open up a new window for me. Okay, and let me resize this so it all shows up on the window correctly. Sorry, I got a lot of things going on my computer since I'm also recording a video right now. Okay, so here we have a lot of observations of the big five personality test. So remember, this is your uh, OCEAN is the acronym. So openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, 
agreeableness, and neuroticism. Okay, so these are the five personality traits that these scales measure, and these are some scores on that, and this is for 500 individuals. So you might be interested in knowing what's the correlation between, say, openness and neuroticism. How would we do that? So let's go and do a Bayesian correlation. So we're going to find this under the regression function. And you can do a classical one with p-values, or you can go to the Bayesian version, which is what we're going to do. So we're going to do Bayesian correlation. And again, the two that I'm interested in are uh, openness and neuroticism. So the first thing I'm going to do is make this a little bit easier to see. I'm going to display a pairwise table. And you'll see real quickly it's going to give me the correlation. And it's going to give me the Bayes factor associated with that correlation. Now one thing you might notice immediately is that the correlation is very small. It's negative 0.01. So maybe there's no correlation going on here. And in fact, that's what this Bayes factor is telling me. This is a Bayes factor for model one over model zero, which is less than one, which actually means that model zero, the null, has the greater support. Remember in JASP, you can easily cast the Bayes factor in favor of the other model by just selecting BF01 down here under Bayes factor. And so you'll see that that now updates to a Bayes factor for the null of 17.4, okay? So again, that's the minimal stuff, but you would like to be able to see you know, the, the prior posterior plot, those kinds of things. So for this one, what we would do is we have to go down here to this plot individual pairs thing, okay? And the way we do this is we then put those two variables in there into this little box here that puts them as a pair. And over here, it's gonna go ahead and create a scatter plot for us. Let's look at that. You can see that that scatter plot definitely has no positive or negative trend. So that's, that's why it looks like there's no correlation. We can see the prior and posterior plot by, well, selecting prior and posterior. Okay. And so it's going to do that for us. There's the prior and posterior plot. Now you can see in this case, what's happening is the, the belief that rho equals zero, that is the belief in the null, is actually increasing once we see the data. So that tells you that the, the model that's more supported is the null hypothesis. The, the support for the null increases after seeing data. In fact, it increases by a factor of 17.4. And just like before, you can change the prior by adjusting the prior uh, parameter. That prior parameter is up here, stretch beta prior width. If I wanted to use the one where it's peaked in the middle, I would say 0.5. And it's gonna take just a second for that to recompute. Okay, I had to hit return. Okay, so there's that. Again, we still get a reasonably large Bayes factor in favor of the um, in favor of the null hypothesis. So, uh, just like before, you can actually do that robustness check if you want, and just check in, you know simultaneously all possible widths of the prior. What kind of inference do we get? And you can see that uh, across. So let's let's just take a look here. So. Across everything from 0.5 up to 2, we're in the strong category. If you get a little bit uh, more peaked at zero, it falls down into this moderate range. So it's not quite as clear an, uh, a picture of evidence as the last one, but certainly for the, for the default prior of one, and even for this one at 0.5, we're certainly in that strong evidence category. So there, there's reasonably good evidence overall uh, that we have a zero correlation. That is, there is no correlation between openness and neuroticism. Now remember, when you have no correlation, that is you have support for the null hypothesis, that means that rho equals zero. There's no estimation that needs to occur. Yes, it goes ahead and computes the credible interval because it's just you know some of the mass of the posterior, but the model that gets the highest support is the null. So we're specifying the, the value of, of rho under the null. There's no need to do estimation at that point. Okay, so that's Bayesian correlation. Remember, um, use that template and uh, to go along with JAS and really make a nice rich write-up from the quite easily attainable information that you can get from JASP about correlations with just a few clicks. So I hope you enjoy, I uh, hope you can do this with your own work, and I hope that it is useful to you. In the next video, we will be looking at the Bayesian t-test, and we'll use a lot of the same workflow, and so I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, see you next time.